Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today I thought it would be interesting to talk about analogous research, uh, because I, you know, there's been a lot of stuff in the news lately about, uh, about misogyny and, you know, there's Gamergate and stuff. It's not the only thing that's been in the news. Uh, I also read an article recently about uh, prisons, and this was kind of interesting, is, uh, is women's, women's prisons. They make a lot of bootleg makeup. And uh, at first it wouldn't be something you would think that would come up, but then you realize that they do bootleg uh, tattoos, and you start to think that, yeah, if you were locked away in a cell for like... 20 years of your life and had nothing to do, you might come up with creative ways to decorate your body. Uh, I wonder, I kind of wonder if they do piercings, but I sort of doubt it. There's not very many things that you would ever want to like pierce with, and they probably take that crap out of your ears. Like, thinking about metal stuff, sharp, sharp little metal things that, I don't know. But, uh, but people probably would though, I imagine if you could, if you could get away with piercing in prison, they'd probably do that. They'd probably do a lot of things in prison if they could get away with it. Uh, in fact, I understand they do do a lot of things in prison if they can get away with it. But I was just reading an article about how they do it, and like, uh, like they crush up Jolly Ranchers and make powder out of like fruit, fruit punch uh, packets and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting. Not something I ever thought about in the past. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Aside from aside from the other articles that are in the news, they've been talking about like they had shirt gate. And uh, people, people send me, you know, emails and comments on it every now and then. They're just like, what do you think about Shirtgate? Or what do you think about this or that? And Shirtgate was like, they had that guy who landed the comment, the comment on the asteroid. And uh, when he went to go talk about it, he was wearing this really tacky shirt that like a lady friend of his had, had made for him. And it was like uh, covered in, in like sexy ladies. And so a bunch of feminist activists got really mad at him. And then he, they shouted at him until he like apologized in tears. But then I guess he didn't change his Facebook pictures, and so like people got on his Facebook, and they were like, "You are a bad person still." So, uh, yes, uh, I don't know the the whole thing with just uh, society and looking at society. Uh, like I said, I've been on I've been on either side of the debate, talking to either side of people, and uh, and it's very strange because no matter which side you talk about, as soon as you start to try to say like. Why don't you look at it from their perspective? You get you get branded poorly. If you go and you do it on like poll, and you're like, well, you know, if you look at it from this perspective, you know, they could have some understandable fears about this or that. And then they call you a shill, you know, and they they're like, ah, get out of here, shill. You know what you're talking about. Not everybody will do that. You'll get some people who will accept your opinion. But like I was, I said in the political polarization video, you find that people more on the right side of things will tend to like like uh, the political right, that is, will tend to be willing to argue with you, but they do so from more uh, oh, what's a good word? Like, they do it from, like, a single perspective. They kind of have their, their sources of information that they go to a little bit more exclusively. And so they'll argue with you from a, from a somewhat singular perspective. And if you go to the left side of the websites, you find that they just block you. And so when I go to, like, the left, when I've gone on, like, Reddit, and I'm like, so, I, I mean, like, the people in, you know, the people in this side of the argument are just humans, guys. Like, uh, I find that about half of my comments will get blocked. Uh, I'm one of those people who's like allowed to continue to post, like I don't get banned, but, uh, or, or as far as I can tell, I guess they do shadow banning. I don't get banned, uh, I just have like half of my comments deleted, because anytime I say something that, uh, like it's weird, like they're just like, they're just like, oh, I don't know, that's kind of shaky, and so they just delete it. And so it'll be weird, because I'll have these like, I'll have these, these arguments that'll be like constructed, you don't need the previous comment to understand where I'm coming from. But they like delete the previous comment because it said something that was like, was like, think about them as being human beings. And they're like, no, 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 heretical, delete, 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 they're not human. And then, uh, and then you go on and I'm like, I'll talk about positivity. I'll be like, so what you need to do is be more positive and think of how to be constructive. And like, you've got this problem that you perceive, why not be constructive about it instead of trying to destroy the other side? So, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, been on both sides of the debate. Um, <laughs> I don't... I don't know. I don't know which side is harder to to speak to. Like I said, I don't get I don't get banned from conversation with the right side of the with the right side of the, the debate. Um, I don't feel like I make much progress when I get to arguing with people on the far far right of, of the whole thing. But uh, but at least I get to argue. On the left side, I just get kind of like I get weirdly I get like patchy arguments where I'm allowed to talk and then. But, to, but not to say that it's like more fruitful or productive on, I, I, I don't know. It's just just very strange. So I thought that I would talk about uh, how we kind of develop societal models, how we figure things out. Because uh, what comes up I find a lot, which really weird when I go and I debate with the whole, with the left side of things, 
is that we get these these bizarre societal models and they're like utopian societal models where people are saying like people are like this or people should be like this and uh, and this is why society needs to change and historically speaking this is actually not weird you find that the left side of politics is they, they tend to be the ones who embrace these sort of things when communism rolled around it was actually the intellectuals the the leftward thinkers who were more uh, liable to embrace the communist ideas and say like this is how we would make an ideal society you know in theory this is how this would work with the trouble being that uh, everybody's a little bit different and you find that when you take this utop utopian worldview and you try to apply it to society that uh, uh, everybody being different means that some people will react to your utopian society a little bit differently and they will maybe not follow the utopian society exactly as you anticipated they will do their own thing they might even completely train wreck your utopian society so it's it's kind of like a stalin didn't follow the utopian rules of of the communist thing and he sort of uh, train wrecked the whole utopia made it slightly less utopian and and virtually every every uh, communist society kind of did this as you had the people who were in charge were human and they were trying to get all these other people to follow these rules and so eventually i mean you just sort of naturally deviated away from the utopian theory because because uh, social models are so very inaccurate. So a lot of what we do um, when we try to understand how people work and how society works is we don't actually do things where we look at where we make these corollary studies where we say like, oh, you know, we pulled 100 people and found out that 70% of them said that they would be happier if society were doing this or whatever. We don't really rely on that. What we try to do, and the reason why this is much slower and why it's much less exciting for people, is we do a lot of uh, analogous research. And analogous research is when you, you start with something small, like you look at fruit flies or whatever, and fruit flies have plenty of the same chemicals and, and uh, DNA or whatever that uh, people do. I mean, they, fruit flies have considerably less DNA, but they have, they have their sequences. And they, they live, they're basic little organisms, they do their, their basic things. So if you wanted to figure out like what causes depression, you might be able to try and figure out, you, like you could try to create depressed fruit flies. Uh, this not so simple because the trouble with trying to figure out mental disorders is that you have to be able to observe depression. Like how would you figure out whether or not a fruit fly, fruit fly was depressed? You can't talk to a fruit fly. And, uh, and even with people, you find that if someone is born uh, with depression, like if, they have, if they're depressed throughout their entire life, then they don't really realize that they're depressed. You could talk to them, you'd be like, so do you feel sadder than you usually do? And they'd say, no, I feel about the same as I have my entire life, but they've always been depressed. That's just been life for them. So you get these kind of hurdles when you study this kind of thing. And, uh, and so yeah, so fruit flies. So if you could figure out a way to determine that fruit flies are depressed, then with analogous research, you could, you could try to trigger a gene that would cause depression. You could try to examine this sort of thing. Uh, what I did when I was in a lab, when I was in, in undergraduate studies, was uh, we focused on nicotine addiction. Is we tried to make fruit flies addicted to nicotine, so we could see like what genes are responsible for nicotine addiction, and uh, and so they went through and they they just bred these these family line after family line of fruit flies that were really that were like happy with nicotine, or this was actually a nicotine resistance in this case, as they were just breeding with, like lines to figure out what what genetics are happy with uh, with nicotine. What, what, which ones can survive. We tried nicotine addiction, but one of the experiments that we did, it didn't produce very good results, so it kind of went nowhere. Uh, yes, but anyway though, so you start with a really simple animal when you're trying to figure out how people work. Because the key to making a, a, a model to understand people is not to figure out how all of society works and to say this is how all of society functions and so we'll make a model of society and then using this ideological model of society we'll fix all the people. It's to figure out what causes all the individual differences in human beings. Like what chemical makes you happy, what chemicals make you sad, like what, what kind of like brain patterns make you more conservative, what kind of brain patterns make you more leftward thinking, how does nature and nurture apply if you can even quantify that stuff. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to figure out what really makes people tick. So, uh, because after all, like I say, if you try to make an ideal society, if you make a model for a human, and you say that everyone, you know, everyone in society functions for these reasons, you'll find out that like 90% of people don't really fit the model. 
uh, many people may sort of fit the model, but only if you force them. You know, you have to you have to get like a broom and just jab them into the you know get, get the model fit in the freaking you know this is how this is gonna work, guys. And then if they don't cooperate, you have to create gulags and you send people out to the gulags, and uh, and that's how that works. That's that's why that's one of the reasons why there's actually a lot of backlash against the feminist stuff is it's not because people don't want women to have equal pay or it's not because they they don't understand or appreciate that there are double standards it's because um you're seeing a lot of this the, the model stuff where they sort of get into like a rape culture and they say uh, all of society is like this and we need to make these changes to fix society and it's this crap where it's sort of like you're saying all of society works this way but uh truth be told it's it's just an ideal social model and and you don't <laughs> Like, some, some people might fit within your social model, a couple of them might, but uh, there are so many people who don't fit in the model that you're really kind of going along with this broom, and you're, you're just jamming people with the broom, and you're saying, you know, get in the model, you fit in the model, and that way we'll fix all of society. And it's never going to work, you'll never fix society by following this social model. Never in the history of ever has that ever worked because social models just don't uh, they don't account for individual differences it just kind of it's sort of this broad idea you know like everyone everyone's kind of the same if you get right down to it and you know, it's not true everybody is not the same so um so yes so what you'll start you'll start with something very small though when you're trying to figure out people you start with something very small like a fruit fly and you try to figure out uh, what kind of genetic differences are causing different things to happen in the fruit flies? What makes them more active? What makes them more more uh, lethargic? Like what makes them tolerate nicotine? What, what does this or what does that? And these are very difficult questions because you find that uh, that with just even their very small numbers of DNA that all these different traits kind of combine to form this tolerance for addiction and if you screw around with these different traits then you get you get wildly different fruit fly behaviors or different levels of health like fruit flies that are really great at surviving in nicotine might not survive cold very well so you get a cold snap that comes around and boom all the all the fruit flies are dead so uh, you might not find fruit flies like that in nature or you might not find people who are like really able to survive uh, with with a high nicotine addiction like if you force people to smoke cigarettes uh, all day long every day or whatever uh, surely you would have people like gradually the people who survived long enough to have kids would have kids but then when it got cold, their kids would just die. So, um, yeah, I mean, you find this kind of stuff out through research as you, you kind of look into this and you don't realize necessarily uh, what the results are going to be. But that's why you start with something small like fruit flies. Uh, once you think you've identified something, though, once you think you've found like a gene or a chemical or something like that, you can move on to slightly more complex creatures like rats or whatever. And, you, and then you kind of look at, uh, at... So, like, we have these rats, and rats also have a... You know, like they give they give birth to new generations of rats like every year, so you can collect the rats and then have them give birth to this. You could try to follow the genetic stuff with rats, but it's harder than fruit flies. It's less ideal. So what they tend to do with rats then is they kind of look at like a, a chemistry, and so they say, okay, like we think that this particular chemical in the brain causes depression, so we're going to give these rats these this injection and see whether or not it makes them kind of lethargic. And so this is how they find out stuff like if you have if you don't have enough serotonin, if you don't have if your serotonin levels are very low, then you might become depressed and uh, and you know, stuff they they look at stuff like that or they they apply medicine to the rats and see how they respond to things. Do they become more active when they have serotonin? And you find out that in some cases this is true. But the brain is very complex. So Although some rats get better when you give them more serotonin or whatever, they become more active, not every rat uh, is, is inactive because of low serotonin levels. There might be other things going on. They might have certain genetic stuff going on. And it's, uh, it's very challenging to say. Uh, there's so many individual variances that what causes one person to be depressed is completely different from what causes another person to be depressed. And you find this out working with rats is you get like a certain percentage of these rats will respond to this chemical in a particular way and other rats will respond to it in a different way and this is because of uh, just natural selection as you find that everybody's a little bit different because if everybody were exactly the same then the first major fault with our genes would kill everybody so uh, individuality is very important not just to humans but to rats and fruit flies and everything else uh, this is why again ideal social models never work out because an ideal social model assumes a completely homogenous popula uh, population and uh, you do not have a completely homogenous population. If you did, we would all die at the first sign of trouble. Um, so, 
Pretty cool with this. Uh, after, after you're done with your rats, though, then you can move on to even more complex creatures. Humans are always really the very last step. And this is one thing that I have concern with. When you talk about uh, establishing laws or trying to change society based on, like, corollary data. Because if you started with humans, and then you just continue to move on with humans, then, like, if your data's flawed, if your research is flawed, then you can cause, you can really cause damage. And this is one thing I worry about, is, is the, the reason I concern myself uh, as much with this whole Gamergate thing is because I honestly don't think that gaming is, uh, is really, like, misogynistic. I've never really been in that impression. Uh, I mean, like, I know that they depict, uh, that they depict female characters as being half-naked in plenty of games, but that's, there's a very high, like, male demographic, and guys like that, like, they're, they're attracted to women. And uh, so it's not weird. I mean, like, the comic book industry was that way, too. And, uh, and it's not bad to want to appeal to women. They, they try to. I mean, you find, like, when they say, like, oh, they don't do this with guys. This is one that's weird, is you see people who have never played games, who are, like, uh, who they post pictures of, like, I remember they posted a picture of a guy in, like, a, they call it a cock sock, which is, which is where you're, like, uh, you know, you just wear, like, a sock over your junk. And they were like, and they're like, this is what guys would look like if they were uh, sexualized in video games. And you know that these people have never played video games because if they had, they would have seen what guys look like when they get sexualized in video games. I mean, just pop in like Dynasty Warriors three and check out Zhang. Hey, the guy runs around. He's like shirtless. He's got like makeup on, long flowing hair. Uh, Dion Wei runs around and like I, he's got like a I don't know. He's totally shirtless as well, really buff. You've got all these different like male. Di uh, there's uh, Hey Hachi in in Tekken four just goes out in like a thong. That's like all he's wearing. He's got like thong and clogs. The guy's just stark naked aside from that. So, uh, so I mean, clearly, clearly they do sexualize men. They would love it. I'm, I'm sure that the gaming industry would be just thrilled. Actually, the entire media world would just be thrilled if they could figure out how to bring women in. But the trouble is that uh, they've done research and they find that men are more, are more visual. And so men can, can, they can be stimulated through like just looking at women. And men are kind of happier with that, whereas women kind of have, they have more varying taste, as you find that women don't, some, some women like really big guys, they like very buff, you know, like, oh, he's really big, you know, he's, that's, ooh, that's intimidating. And then the guys kind of like, uh, kind of like their, you know, the best shonen, the best be shonen, whatever, uh, the bishies. They, they like the guys who are more uh, androgynous, like maybe like longer hair, more more girly features, sort of stylish. And so you find, that, and then there are women who you kind of notice, they have a pattern of liking guys who are just uh, gifted socially. And so like guys who are very clever and they make a lot of jokes and stuff like that. And in that case, they're not worried so much about looks, they just, they really get attached to the guys who are kind of eloquent speakers. And so you find that women have more diverse interests and you can try to appeal to women by by kind of selling them sex but to do so you need a more diverse cast of male characters you need guys that are like socially gifted or you need guys that are really buff and then you need guys that are also kind of uh, kind of uh, more androgynous like all these different guys uh, are required you, you, you need a variety of styles to attract women more so which is a great deal more challenging it's not it's not as low hanging of fruit and so you find that like a lot of industries just don't go for it. Uh, I've seen articles talking about this whole thing too as well. They talk about like, yeah, uh, feminists have been trying to like shut down porn for ages, but the trouble is that the money in porn is that they're just trying to be sexy and they're trying to sell sex. And so you can't really, uh, I mean, it's kind of like you, you can't get the sex out of sex. It's just sort of like people like sex. You can't, you can't convince them to not like sex. I mean, it kind of goes counterintuitive to psychology. And some people don't, don't like it. What I suspect what might be going on is that some of the speakers involved in this sort of thing are, are kind of speaking from themselves. They're making these social models and, and it's based on kind of their own personal experiences. Uh, and this is actually why I think you find a lot of hate speak, uh, not, not exclusively, in basically any ideology. Because you get people who are kind of very misanthropic and they don't really get people. So they sort of look at the world and they, they kind of do so with this very dim worldview of like everything's wrong and everybody's wrong and everybody needs to be fixed. And so they kind of get up there and they say like everybody's wrong for these reasons. And they don't understand uh, like how would you have a healthy relationship? This sort of thing. Like they get into this and they're like, you know, like all men have these terrible toxic relationships with women and they need to be stopped. And so they're making these models based on just personal experience, you know, or case studies, things like that. And, uh, 
And like I say, it's all based on just their own personal perspective of life. It's not really like they didn't go through, they didn't have like lab rats where they tested lab rats and were like, how did the lab rats form toxic relationships? What's, what are they doing? Uh, like, are they abusive? Are they not? Because this is something that you could do. You could probably actually look at lab rats and you could find, uh, you could find like lab rats that uh, were more hostile towards their partners, and you could probably uh, breed them or do experiments if you had a theory where you were like, I think there's maybe a gene that causes this hostility, or there might be some kind of chemical imbalance. You really could look at this, but it would be kind of, it would be, it would be very much in the realm of science, is you would start there and you would look at like, what's causing this? Uh, you know, it's, it's surely it's not, surely it's not rat society. There's, there's got to be some kind of thing, some kind of individual quirk that causes this. And, uh, and you could follow it along from generation to generation and maybe isolate like a particular gene or chemical imbalance that causes this particular thing. And then you could use analogous research to kind of generalize over to people. And you could say that, uh, okay, probably there's this gene that causes hostility uh, towards, towards uh, probably, uh, broadly speaking, I would suspect that if you, had, if you had hostility, it wouldn't be just towards the opposite gender. It's probably broadly directed at, at everybody. And uh, this is what I think, is I think you could just find like a general hostility gene. And, uh, and the trouble is that when you get into like romance, romance involves a lot of trust between two people. And so if there's a lot of hostility in general, like a, a hostile person won't be immediately hostile towards someone that they're in love with, but once they get comfortable, that's when they sort of fall back into their old patterns and they start to get hostile. And that's why romance can be like a trap for some people. That's why, that's why I think for many people it seems very sinister. Um, but yes, but I don't believe it's a societal thing. I really just believe it's something like, uh, like I say, some people are just very hostile. And you find that people kind of, they tend to date the same person over and over again. So you wind up with these people who, who date very hostile people, or who are themselves quite hostile. And so they date, and then they become hostile over time, and then the whole religion, uh, the whole, uh, uh, excuse me, the whole relationship just becomes uh, kind of nasty. And so then they kind of extrapolate. They say like, all love, all love is toxic and evil and men are evil. And this is just, you know, like men don't understand. I've seen these articles where they talk about like, men need to understand that women deserve to be emotionally distant. And, uh, and that's kind of like, uh, so that one's sort of a strange one where you've got this woman speaking from her personal experience as being a, a woman who's admittedly emotionally distant. And then she blames her partners. And she's like, I, you know, like it's the men's fault. They don't understand my independence. And it's kind of like, um, no, you're emotionally distant. It's it's uh, it might be you. So, um, yes. Where was I going? I had another thought that I wanted to express based on all that. Um, yeah. So, so I guess anyway, what I'm getting at is that you get these case studies, case studies, corollary data. It's not very strong for creating hypothesis or for for figuring out how you want to influence society. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to try to influence all of society broadly. It's fine if you want to make personal observations about your own life. If you want to say like, okay. Uh, it, it reflects on you. Honestly, I feel like it does. If you say all of society is bad, all of, all of society is misogynist, uh, everyone in society is focused entirely on gender and nothing else, um, it probably reflects on you a great deal if you think this. Because in my life experience, this is not true. It doesn't seem to me like people are very... Uh, the average person is not all that worried about about gender. I mean, I don't, I don't think so, anyway. Um, but it reflects on you because you're probably drawing on a lot of personal experience where gender was like this really big conflict. And, uh, and, and maybe, like for broadly speaking, that, that might be an individual pattern. And, uh, and it may not be the best thing to do to make a whole societal model based on your individual things. Uh, because you look at people like Dworkin, who, who's been kind of behind a lot of the, uh, a lot of the more vitriolic stuff. She's she's rather famous for stuff like I she she said that all men should be castrated all men it's basically hate speak like I said this kind of stuff it does attract hate speakers because they see this very negative deconstructive talk and they say like yeah yeah I want to destroy society I hate society I want to kill everybody and so they get in there and they're like yeah finally you know it's just it's virtuous to want to kill everybody I always knew I was right and to, to hate everybody so you get people like Dwork and you're like I hate all men I want to destroy all men I'm a I'm a Miss Andrews she's like a self-proclaimed Miss because I just want to destroy everyone and uh, and you know and it's kind of like but that's Dworkin. You know, it's, it's not like all of society, like Dworkin makes these observations about how, like, 
why do I hate everybody? Oh, it's, it's clearly because of stuff that people are doing. You know, it's not me. It's because of the society. It's because of the world. And so she, you know, she makes these like ideological societal models where she assumes that everybody else is wrong. Like the reason why she hates everybody is because of stuff that everybody else is doing. When in reality, it's just Dworkin. Like it's just her. It's, it's really not society. It's just that Dworkin is one of these people, individually speaking, she might be very hostile. And, uh, and because she's hostile towards people, people are hostile towards her. And so in her little world, in her, in her personal sphere, there is a lot of hostility. Uh, there's a lot of hostility towards feminism because she, she believes herself to be a feminist and she expresses a lot of hostility in the name of feminism and she gets a lot of hostility coming back towards her because she's very hostile. And so she makes this, this uh, uh, societal theory that, uh, that everyone is hostile because they hate feminism and the reality is uh, they just hate Dworkin. Like this is just how it is. It's, just, it's you. It's her. It's this the whole time. It's, it's always been her. Um, so yeah, so these, these models, the societal models, case study models, uh, corollary data, they're really not very strong. A lot of times if you want to figure out people and how people work and what their, their individual things are, you really have to look at people individually and you have to understand how people work in a more complex, a biological, genetic way. You, you've got to take your analogous research and say like, okay, rats are affected by these chemicals, so people are probably affected by these chemicals. And this says nothing about how many people have this hostility gene. It says nothing about how many people are going to be depressed. It just shows that uh, if you have these chemicals in your brain or if you have these genes, then you might be predisposed to these kind of behaviors. And then that's how you actually develop models about how people work. And you can understand, you can actually quantify how accurate these models are. Because you find out, like I say, that maybe having low serotonin levels might cause depression, but might not be the cause of depression in everything. So, uh, so it's very complex. In reality, understanding how people work is, uh, is very complex, very challenging. There's no shortcut. Uh, just because one guy wears a shirt that has naked ladies on it doesn't mean that he has a gene that would cause him to be uh, hostile towards women or anything like that. It doesn't mean he hates women. It, me it meant that he had a friend who made him a shirt, who was a lady friend, and he didn't have a lot of sense. It was a very tacky shirt. I mean, like, everyone kind of agrees. Yeah, it was a really tacky shirt. It wasn't a very professional thing to wear on, like, an interview. But maybe in his head, maybe he's, like, really fond of this lady friend, and he thought that she would be really impressed if he wore the shirt because she made it for him. So it's kind of like a... It wasn't misogyny that motivated him to do this. It was like he wanted to make his lady friend happy, which is kind of like the opposite of misogyny. It's just, uh, it's just silly. It was just, it was just a dumb human thing that this guy did that like, uh, you know, I don't know. But like I say, you get people who want to like, they want to have their social models, their ideal social model. And they got this guy and, and he wasn't really being misogynist, but they got the broom and they jabbed him with it. And they said, get in there, get in there. You're going to go to the gulag. And, uh, and so he got up and he apologized in tears. He goes, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm so misogynist. I can't believe. I just, oh, I don't know what I was thinking. And, uh, and yeah, weird, weird, weird. But uh, yes, on that note, uh, one, one thing I wanted to say before I close is I've talked about uh, Christina Hoff Somners and she's a, she's an expert on, on uh, feminism, really. She's actually a philosophy major, but she comes from a right-wing think tank. And I've talked about her before, but uh, as I talk about science and research methodology and how we actually come to understand people, uh, this is one thing that I think is really interesting, is you see a lot of people that they want to they wanna develop these, these really uh, low-hanging, simple, like, these explanations about people are very convenient. And like I say, you get, a, you get a lot of hate speakers because hate speakers want to have an explanation. Like, it's not me, it's the world, right? Like, uh, everyone hates me because of misogyny. Not because I'm a terrible person, it's because of misogyny. Like, I'm, I'm mean to everybody and everybody is mean back to me because of them. You know, it's not, it's not me, I'm not evil, it's them that's evil. So you get that, we have a lot of hate speakers. But... The trouble is, is that when you start to look at uh, real research methodology and you start to speak to, you start to look at the real experts and see what they're doing, when they get to a certain point, when they really know their stuff, uh, it's, it's difficult to really debate and evaluate what they're doing. Like I've watched Christina Hoff Somners and uh, her chops are good. Like she talks about uh, research methodology and she knows about a lot of theories. She's been critical of, an, of Anita Sarkeesian. She talks about like, uh, how old some of Anita Sarkeesian's views are. 
like Anita is using uh, research that's like decades old. Like I think I think one that was brought up is she was using some kind of research that was like three decades old and it's since been uh, rebuilt. And I mean it was it was like that people didn't even like modern feminists don't even like follow this old this old research anymore. It was just something that that Anita uh, knew about and and it was like kind of like I said it's like low hanging, easy to explain. Everyone's everyone's misogynist. I'm okay. Everyone else is wrong. And that sort of thing. Uh, but when you start to look at that, when someone like when someone like Christina Hoff Sommer says, uh, uh, "Oh, this research is like three decades old," and here's like the more modern research, that's when you start to get into like expertise that uh, that someone like myself. I I heard her like, I watched the video where she said this, and like I say, I watch I watch I try to look into various perspectives, and you find that. Uh, you really couldn't debate with it, you couldn't argue with it. If you put me in a room with Christina Hoff Somers and told me to debate with her, she would just mop the floor with me. I would be I would be destroyed. I would just be like, well, uh, maybe consider this. And she would have so much more background knowledge on the subject that there was just, just no way that I could stand up. I feel like with someone with like Anita Sarkeesian, Anita's not very well informed. She she tends to I mean like she tends to just make a lot of really broad generalizations and she uses a lot of like really weak data. And so you could put me in a debate room with Anita Sarkeesian and I could fight her out. But with a real expert, with someone like Christina Hoff Somners, uh, I would be helpless. And there's people on the left, uh, on the left side of stuff. Uh, Christina, Christina Hoff Somners has gotten popular because she, she speaks to a point of view that, that they kind of want to hear what she has to say. Like when she says, like, this is wrong, uh, people want to hear it. And so that makes her that makes her popular. People go to her. You find that more, like I say, more right-leaning people will seek out the point of view that they want. And so you get, like I say, you get more arguments from this particular point of view. So Christina Hoff Somner, being a little bit more conservative, she speaks to the conservative audience, and they kind of gravitate towards her. Uh, but I'm sure that there are people on the left who also maintain the same expertise, who could tell you uh, their own views, their own expertise. But the trouble is that you need you need some expertise and understanding to be able to really look at people and even and even evaluate whether or not they're an expert, because. Uh, this is one that blows my mind is when I read about Anita uh, Sarkeesian being an expert and I'm not sure like she has a PhD but it's in like TV studies or something like that like television something something really weird that I never heard of before and uh, like I, I, I don't know her grasp of research methodology seems really weak her grasp of like like I say, like, uh, like you, you, she gets called out for having like really dated knowledge of the stuff that she's talking about, and uh, I, it's she's not really a scholar. She's not doing research. She doesn't really have like a like she'll make a hypothesis, and then instead of like researching the hypothesis, she just kind of like assumes it's true, and then makes her videos based around the assumption that her hypothesis is correct, and and so she's not really like a. She's not a scholar, but a lot of people think she's a scholar because they don't know what a scholar is supposed to actually be doing. They think that like Anita has all this knowledge that she's using, and they don't realize that that uh, she's not really an authority on anything. Anita's just a she's a blogger. I mean, she's a really popular blogger. Like everybody kind of like a bunch of people know who she is now, but but she's not really an expert uh, in anything. And this is probably part of the problem is you're getting a lot of people now with the, with the social media and everything else who are starting to build themselves as like experts, not because they know a lot, but because they're just very popular. You know, you get these, you get bloggers that just go up there and they're like, yeah, yeah, I read, I read this, like, I read this piece by Dworkin, some that was written some like 20, 30 years ago or whatever. And they're like, so this is true and this is what I believe now. And they have no idea that, that that piece by Dworkin was like utterly debunked all of like 25 years ago or something like that. And the current research has taken a completely different turn. It's focused on completely different things. But people still go to these these blogs or these vloggers, you know, whatever, and they and they follow them as if as if they were experts, as if they had like you know like you find like oh she's got a PhD in like television basket weaving or whatever. And, uh, and it's like, and, and television, television basket weaving did not include a course on proper research methodology because there's really no research branch in basket weaving, underwater basket weaving. So, uh, yeah, this is the other thing that's weird, is, is like I say, like, someone like Christina Hoff Somners could totally mop the floor, but I don't know of many popular bloggers that, uh, that have, like, a, a real PhD 
that focus heavily on research methodology that get big, they get really popular. Um, or the ones that do, they get really big and popular because they're so controversial and everybody talks about them. So it's kind of like they're big by virtue of controversy and not by virtue of having really solid methodology. And even Christina Hoff Sommers, her videos, she she deconstructs the the research, but she doesn't talk much in her videos about reconstructing the research. She doesn't talk about how they could be better explored. And I've heard that she has books where she does talk about how the research could be better constructed. But uh, but the big stuff that everybody knows her for, the videos, don't uh, don't actually. Uh, discuss any of that stuff. They just deconstruct some of the data. They just say uh, they just say this is wrong because, and then she doesn't go in to say like, and this is how we're really going, and this is uh, this you know moving forward. This is how we're trying to get the kinks out of these theories. Um, she mostly just kind of debunks stuff. So I don't know. Interesting, but uh, but a good a good reason to always try to be informed and to understand. Uh, like when you see a researcher, you have to realize that Christina Hoff Somner, she has her biases and she has her perspectives, and you can't you can't take it 100% on faith that she's uh, always correct about everything. You have to appreciate when she points out uh, bad research methodology that uh, that may in fact be a problem with the studies and it needs to be addressed. But uh, in science, the way that they address that is they construct more more uh, studies with appreciation for that detail in mind. What Christina Hoff Somner does. It's valuable. Um, it may disagree with this this other perspective, but um, but you know, is, is if you can if you can take her criticism and then use it to build a better study, then that's ideally what you want to do. If you can't do that, then you're working in an ideology or you're dealing with pseudoscience. It's really not it's really not something that has any substance to it. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's that's analogous research. That's a little bit more about uh, just research methodology in general, uh, understanding experts on the internet, understanding who's not experts, uh, understanding how people create arguments or theories from personal perspectives that uh, may sound very convincing, but honestly just attract hate speakers because it's a convenient way to explain why they should be allowed to hate people. And just be aware of that. If you're ever part of a, I mean like, Nobody joins a cult or like an ideological movement with malice in mind, but if you ever join a group and you look around and you start to realize that there's a lot of people in your group that are calling for like the death of all uh, X or like, like, you know, like if somebody ever gets up and they say like, you know what we need to do is we need to come up with a final solution for all of this group. Um, be aware that like, uh, you know, uh, to, to invoke uh, Godwin's law here, the reason why people talk about the Nazis so much is because what was really scary about them was that the Nazis were just like ordinary assholes who got to be in charge. I mean like Himmler was a chicken farmer. The guy wasn't, he wasn't somebody like spectacular, he was just a chicken farmer and he believed in eugenics and he wasn't like educated. He didn't really, I mean he didn't really know what he was doing. But, but most of the Nazis were kind of like this, is they just sort of believed in this crap. And they believed in it because it sounded convincing. They were many of them were very misanthropic individuals. They were kind of petty. They weren't really very stellar minds. They like, you know, Hitler was a failed artist. He really wasn't. He wasn't like that clever. So they put together this this. They were trying to build their their society based on these these social models that they had invented, where they were trying to explain like I'm mad at the Jews and this is what's wrong with them and. So if we make a society that's perfect based on my understanding of why I'm right about everything, then you know, and, and you find that what they did was horrible and atrocious. But they were just they were just ordinary guys, and that's that's what's horrifying about it, and that's why uh, for so long, for for after World War II, uh, they've tried to drill it in our heads, not to get so full of our not to get so full of ourselves that we ourselves wind up accidentally uh, becoming that that's dangerous to society. Um, and this goes for both sides. Like I said, I've argued with both sides of the things, and there are people like pro Gamergate who are trying to stop, like they're, they're talking about, um, I don't know, like a conspiracy of Marxism. And uh, and as soon as you start saying like, uh, you know, look, this is kind of a dated worldview. They, they get mad and they're like, no, you don't understand like Marxism. And like you try to, you try to, explain to them that, 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 that you know it's like it's not this this is not really like your debates kind of you're kind of in your own little world like I say they 
those guys are on the really far right and they come from just this incredibly narrow perspective. They don't really have much else uh, going for them as far as the debate goes. So so they just they just kind of like they're fighting a, a totally different war. And then you go over on the left side and it's 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 uh, it's the same but different. So yes, um yeah, I mean it's it's just human. It's just it's just very human, very common to fall into these weird weird patterns of social behavior. Um yes. But anyway though, that's why it's good. Stay stay objective. Focus more on like if you're really interested in people and why they behave and the things that they do, think in terms of individuals. Understand that if you want to talk broadly about people, you have to look at more like the Anna analogous studies where they're looking at like so rats have these characteristics and we find we can manipulate their behaviors in this fashion and so then that way that way you're not making like a broad generalization about everybody you're just kind of looking at it and you're saying like okay so serotonin you know in rats clears up depression and so like maybe these people have low serotonin but we find that rats don't really this or that um, it gives you kind of a it gives you kind of a more fluid dynamic approach to humans you can sort of understand that everybody's a little bit different but uh, this could be a cause for this kind of behavior, maybe. And, uh, and maybe that doesn't apply to this person because different kinds of things can cause different kinds of things. But that way, that way you feel like you have a better understanding of people without, without assuming everybody is completely homogenous. It's, it's a way of understanding people while still, while still being able to recognize everybody's individuality. You know, because chemicals affect people differently. People are built differently. Uh, if there's a big cold snap, some of us will die, some of us would live, you know, and that's and that's just natural selection. So, uh, yes, that is that is my thoughts of the day. Um, yes, analogous research, other things, social commentary, so on and so forth. Uh, I guess that's it. So I will catch you guys later.